All right, welcome back. In this video, we're going to focus on how do we compute the equations necessary to generate an interaction diagram. We talked about interaction diagrams in the last video and defined five points along that basic curve. And if you remember, we came up with a diagram that looks something kind of like this as being kind of the ultimate capacity of a column subjected to both axial and moment in varying amounts. And we kind of defined all of our points on this. This was the pure axial point up here. And this was our balance point where concrete and steel both fail at the same time. And then this was a pure flexure point down here and then how we can kind of work through this. So if you don't remember this or you're still a little confused, go back to our last video on um, interaction diagrams and you can kind of, we'll, I'll walk you through this a little bit more in detail. Uh, remember that the eccentricity are the lines that go from zero out to the various points on this curve. And we can use those to make some assumptions and, and, and calculate some things. Okay, so again, I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, go watch that other video uh, for the interaction diagrams and we'll go from there. All right, so with that, we can then go in and bring myself back to my page. We can start talking about eccentrically loaded columns, all right? So what we're gonna look at in this is we're gonna take an arbitrary rectangular column in this case. And th the same approach works for columns, whether it's spirals or whether it's ties or, or something. And spirals become a little bit harder to compute, but it's not bad. Okay, and so the first picture that we're gonna look, look at, um, and it's all about drawing these pictures. And you'll notice just at first glance, this picture looks a whole lot like a Whitney diagram, okay? In fact, you can see that it does have the 0.85 F prime C, and it does have the B, and then this height parameter, which was A when we were doing flexure, is now actually the whole height of the column. The whole thing is working. So this picture is for a concentrically loaded column. Right? There is no moment on this thing, and so what happens is, is that the stress at this point is the same as every other point in the cross section. Okay, and So that's a very important first step. This is the M equals zero case, okay? or the P is equal to axial only case. Okay, and so those become very, very important points on those. Okay, so for this to be a concentric loading only then, you'll notice the one thing that adds into this is before we had, you know, we had in our Whitney block, we had a compressive stuff up here, and then I had a tensile value down on the tensile side, and that was it. Now, in my equation, in my picture, I have to include that axial, axial load value, and I know that it's located at H over 2 down from my point here. So that dimension then is H over 2 for that okay so it should be hopefully makes sense to you if you think about it as a Whitney thing now for a pure axial column the, remember the capacity assumed that I would reach the crushing limit on the concrete and then I would yield the steel and then that's what we would call the the capacity okay um, for for the nominal now again we have remember nominal is also affected by is it spiral is it tied p knots you know all those that were showing up in that table in the last video you also have to conclude but the general picture looks like this so the nominal moment capacity of the column for a load acting at the center of this thing is offset by all of these internal forces and compression on the other side. All right, so this is my stress diagram. Now again, I didn't draw the strain diagram in these. Okay, um, so for our section then, this PC is the plastic centroid. Uh, we assume that we have some amount AS prime and some amount AS2. Okay, now when I said H over 2 here, we made the assumption that AS equals AS prime. Right. If I have a whole lot of steel on one side and not on the other, this point will move. So it might be better off if I just don't include that on there. So I'm going to renege on this and take that thing out. Okay, But for a column where it's equal, and a lot of tied columns will be, this guy will be dead center on things. All right. So all we're going to do then is just like you did with the Whitney block on flexural beams back when we did the SRR stuff or the DR stuff even, is we're going to sum forces in the x direction on that picture. Let's see if I can get us both on there. And so if I do that, I'm going to sum to the forces to the right being positive. Everything else is negative. So it's a positive Pn minus ASFY minus AS prime FY minus 0.85 F prime C B times H, all equal to zero. So for a concentric, concentrically loaded column, Pn then is going to be AS prime FY plus ASFY plus 0.85 F prime C B H. That's it. You've got, the, you've got the first point. This is point number one, once I put the proper coefficient on this thing. Okay, now for an eccentrically loaded column, it gets a little messier, okay? But it's not bad, okay? So the general pictures look something like this. Now what I've done is I've drawn a cross section, 
Okay, and you'll notice that I've turned it a little bit. I put the AS steel, again, this is what I'm assuming would be my tensile steel. So if I put a big enough moment on this thing, AS prime will go into compression and AS will go into tension. And what we normally want is we want a ductile failure on this guy, but again, PN and MN are acting together at the exact same time on this. Okay, and so we've got our plastic centroid, and so the picture that we have is that the axial load is at the centroid, and then that moment is acting about that at about about the cross section as well. Okay, so what we do is we now take this and we change it a little bit. Okay, and I pull this load out such that the distance I pull it to E times PN will get rid of the MN here. Okay, and so that will become my picture. So MN is equal to PN times E, and then E then is MN divided by PN. Okay, so if E is zero, it's a pure axial case. If E is infinity, it's a pure flexure case. All right, so what happens as we look at this, we can start to draw some more generic pictures, and this will look familiar to you as well, I hope. Okay, first one we're going to do is we're going to draw for an eccentric column, you know, with a depth of D and a height of H on this, and a depth of D prime to the second layer of steel, and a width of B on this. This looks exactly like what we did with the SRR, okay? We're going to look at, we're going to start off with the balance case, okay? And when that happens, I know that the strain in AS is epsilon Y, and the strain in the concrete at the top is 0 0.003, okay? And then this point becomes the location of the neutral axis. And we're going to define that as being the balanced neutral axis. CB is going to be down at some point. Now, it may, may line up with the plastic centroid, may not. It may be in the middle. It may not. It depends on kind of the ratios of these things. But it's exactly what you did before. Okay? So what we're going to do then is we're going to carry that neutral axis line through. Okay? And I'm going to include my balanced load, my PB load, by pulling it all the way out to get rid of the MB, right? And we're going to move that a distance of EB off of this point here. So these two pieces are kind of a little bit different than what you're not used to seeing. Everything else is exactly the same. In fact, look, you've got, you know, the Whitney block depth is AB. The height of the stress is 0.85 F prime C. I have my force and compression in the in what would be the top bars or in the compression steel. I have my concrete resultant, 0.85 F prime C B times AB. Okay, and then I have my ASFY in the tensile side, and then of course we have a moment arm that exists in here that is D minus AB over 2 coming from here to here. Okay, now if we go through and add a couple of other dimensions on this, we defined EB, which is the one that shows up on that interaction diagram, is going from the neutral axis up to the load. Okay, but if I'm going to try to write some equations, I kind of need to get some other dimensions in here. So that means then that the distance from A to this neutral axis will be D minus CB, okay? And then we're going to define this kind of second order eccentricity. It's not the true EB, but one for calculating this E double dot B, okay? Or double apostrophe, I guess, okay? That will be the sum of those two values, okay? So here's what we know in an analysis problem. Okay, we know AS, AS prime, B, D, D prime, double prime, FY, and F prime C. Okay, all seems reasonable. Right? You know the steel, you know where it's located, and you know what the beam and the concrete is made out of and what the dimensions of the beam are. Okay, the things that we don't know in this are we don't know the balance load, we don't know the balance eccentricity, I don't know AB, and I don't know what the stress in FS prime is. Okay, we do know the stress in FS that FS is equal to FY. That's prescribed. Okay, because the definition of the balance point is the point at which that occurs. Okay, so we know that the, the, the balance moment is equal to the balance axial load multiplied by the balance eccentricity. Okay, and the thing that's kind of cool about this is that there's only one combination of PB and MB for any cro given cross section. Okay, so there's only one point on that curve that we can define. So that's kind of a cool thought. Okay, and then we'll write down our E double tick uh, balance is equal to the EB that we want plus D minus CB. Okay, all right, so all we're gonna do then is I'm gonna take this picture and I'm gonna sum forces in the X direction. So kind of like what we did for the concentric case, PB will be in there, this ASFS prime, this concrete resultant, and then ASFY will all show up in that. So I can pretty quickly write out the equation for PB accordingly as this. It's exactly like what we did with the concentric case, except now, once I know AB, I know PB, okay? 
All right, and again, notice that what we've done, because it is a scenario where I end up with a part of the concrete in tension, we are still neglecting the tension in the concrete. So this part of the concrete does nothing for me. And that's why the Whitney block is applicable here. Okay, so it's just a straight Whitney calculation that we're doing on that. Okay, now, to get the moment equation, what we're gonna do to kind of help us kind of simplify some of this stuff is I'm gonna sum moments, choose the sum moments on this about the tensile steel. Okay, which is why I needed this E prime prime uh, dimension. Okay, because I could correlate that back to the EB that I really, really want on this. So we're gonna sum moments right here. Okay, so the first term is gonna be PB times E double prime B. Okay, is that moment that comes from this guy. And then I'm gonna take the distance from here to here, which would be the concrete resultant for this one. Okay, so that's gonna be this distance, D minus AB over two. And then the distance from ASFY to my compression steel, which will just be D minus D double prime. Okay, so it should be no surprise, and that's exactly the formula that we've written here. And all of that's gonna be equal to PB times E double prime B. Okay, now if we apply some mechanics, we can come up with some relationships for some pieces in this. All right, again, the one unknown in all of this is this AB thing. All right, so we can do our strain compatibility just like you did with, with flexure, and I can solve for what CB is gonna be that I know that the ratio of this to this dimension is the same as the ratio of this to this dimension, and I can solve for CB. And so that's what we're gonna do here. That CB goes to 0 0.003 is the same as D going to 0 0.003 plus my epsilon Y. Okay, and if it's 60 KSI, this number is roughly, you know, 0 0.005, if you will. Okay, CB then, if I rearrange all of this, is just D times 87 over 87 plus FY. Okay, and then, I can go in and I am missing a D in that formula. Okay, and then I can multiply that by beta one to get me to an AB value. Okay, so if you look at it, I can get AB very, very easily. I know beta one, I know D, and I know FY. I can find him. Okay, as we start to kind of look at that process. Okay, and then we can write out a formula for FS prime, if you will on this that is gonna be kind of a strain compatibility kind of thing again. So FS prime, or epsilon S prime goes to CB minus D double prime is the same as 0 0.003 to CB. And if I rearrange all of this, okay, that I can find out what FS prime is gonna be. And again, we're bounded by the rule that that guy has to be less than or equal to FY. So if you calculate him to be over FY, you have to cap it. It can't take any more than that. And so that will help us get OCB. And so we can start to kind of play some games. So we'll keep track of those formulas. Okay, so what happens is, is we can take those formulas and from one and two, we can solve for PB. So that's our first equation. We talked about that one. Okay, and then once I have that, then I can solve for, you know, the epsilon double prime B because I have a formula for this guy and I can rewrite everything in terms of that. And then I can divide, this is that moment equation, and if I know PB, which I have to have first, I've got it from here, because I now know AB, that I can solve for this E double prime B dimension, okay? And then finally, we know that E double prime B is the eccentricity that I really want, measured from the centroidal axis, plus D minus CB, we got it. And then once I have epsilon B, then I can calculate the, non, the balanced moment as a result. So it all comes through this guy. Once I get PB, I can now calculate this guy. All right, so here's what we find out. Okay, by looking at the picture, you would generate a graph that looks something kind of like this. That this is zero in P0, the pure axial load. This is MB and PB, and it's got this kind of curve that happens. The eccentricity goes from here to here is EB, and then this is the pure flexure scenario, M0, over here. What we know is, is that the line that goes through this point, if I draw that as a tick line, anything above this is a compression controls case. Okay, and anything below it is a tension controls case. All right, and so what do we notice? Well, I can't really look at the moment because you know, moment above M naught doesn't tell me a whole lot, okay, because here and here are both above M naught, but if I divide it this way, I have a clean break of this thing into two different sections, okay? And so what we'll look at then is, is we'll start saying that, oh, if the nominal load on my column is greater than PB, the column is compression controlled, okay, that your point will plot up here somewhere, 
Okay, and likewise, if Pn is less than Pb, the column is tension controlled and it will plot down here somewhere. So that's kind of the basics of our interaction, what we're kind of trying to look at in the basic process. Okay, so I hope that's made some sense to you. Um, for my for the students, I'll kind of walk you through kind of the, the procedure for analyzing this. I've got a fairly complex beam, okay, it's got some funky stirrup steels. Notice we haven't done anything with the stirrups or the shear design on this thing. We just know that we need them to provide confinement for the longitudinal bars, okay. And so in this, what I've calculated is an F prime C that's 3,000 PSI and an FY that's 40,000 PSI, okay. And so the first thing that we ask is, well, which axis is considered to be the strong axis? Okay, and remember the definition of that. Okay, it has to do with IX and IY. It's kind of a supplemental question, okay. And then we want to compute, according to that, we'll compute our AS and our AS prime, okay. And then we can break into some different, some different amounts, if you will, accordingly. So what's going to happen is, is one of these is going to go into tension, and then the other two are probably going to go into compression. And so that's why we kind of break this up. So what we're going to do is we're going to group that as AS, we're going to group this as AS1, and this as AS2, as you start to kind of look at, at that. Um, you'll notice that the, the detailing says that they're all um, all the same bar, they're all number 11s, fairly substantial. Okay, and then I also give you some spacings that should be fairly valid on those. Okay, and then all I ask is that we, you know, the next step then is let's sketch the balance condition. Okay, that's what we just did in the lesson. So you should be able to sketch the strain and then you should be able to sketch the Whitney block. This step you should be able to do without the notes, I'm hoping. Okay, the only thing that you have to add is you have to add in the PB and the EBs accordingly. Okay, but in everything that we've done, and I've said this all along, everything that we do comes back to the strain diagram and then it all comes back to Whitney as I start to kind of to work on that. Okay, and then once you've got that, now you can go in and it's just calculations to find AB and then you calculate your stresses Make sure things have yielded like you thought they would, okay? And then you can go in, and with that, you can compute PB, no problem. I can compute MB, once I have PB and EB, no problem. And then we can calculate the, the balance eccentricity as well on those. And that's kind of the packet that we're looking at being able to do. All right, and with that, I think we will end the lesson there. So I hope that's made some sense to you. Okay, it's kind of how do you calculate that balance point? The balance point by far is the most important of all of them because that's the one that tells me, am I compression controlled, am I tension controlled? And then everything that we do will work off of that point as we start to move forward. And as you get into an advanced design class, uh, you'll use, that, use those values and we'll use these interaction diagrams a whole lot more. Okay, in the coming videos, I'll show you some shortcut methods that don't require us to draw Whitney. I'll go, we'll go to some, some pre-tabulated tables that will help us very quickly generate these curves so that we don't have to. They've generalized them, and those are pretty cool. But we'll save that for another video on another day. So anyway, I hope this has all made sense to you. As always, leave us some comments down below. Give us some feedback. Um, like the video, and as always, subscribe to the channel. And we will see you next time. Happy engineering.